Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. In Alma in Grays Harbor County in Washington, one of my older sisters and her three young daughters were out looking for a place to pick wild blackberries with my younger sister. There were blackberries in abundance there, which was kind of odd considering it was so close to the road and there were many people out picking berries at that time of year. They picked berries for just a few minutes when they began to feel uneasy, like there was someone watching them. The girls started to get scared, and one of them said it was a scary place, which was unusual since it was a nice summer day, and the spot seemed pleasant enough down by the river. After a few moments, their uneasiness turned to outright fear, and they decided to waste no time leaving. My younger sister related the events of the day to me when she got home that evening, and being curious about such things, we decided to make another trip out there the following day so I could experience the oppressive atmosphere firsthand. We lived in Hoquim at the time and got a late start, so it was full dark when we arrived the next evening. But my sister, her husband, and myself were somewhat prepared, having brought flashlight and a point-and-shoot 35mm camera. It was a walk of about 300 yards from the side of the road to the river, and the going was made a bit difficult because of the downhill slope and the fact that it had rained a couple of days earlier and the track was all mud, quite deep in part. We walked and slipped down to the edge of the riverbank and stopped to observe the area. It was very dark and seemed quite isolated, but other than that, it felt normal. No sense of impending doom. No unseen presence felt. We idled around there for about ten minutes and were about to go home when, all of a sudden, there was a tremendous bang. It sounded very much like a shotgun at first, and we thought somebody was shooting at us. We ducked and began to make our way back to the car when we heard a very loud splashing just off the shore on our side of the river. It sounded to me like a cow or a large deer had fallen in and was struggling to swim. Being young and foolish, I thought this would make a very cool picture, so I made my way to the bank and was about to peer over the edge to get my shot when the thrashing ceased, and there was a very distinct sound of a large rock being thrown into the water. This was quickly followed by another, and soon another. I turned to my sister, and she said, Oh my God, there's someone throwing rocks. And by this time, her brave husband was already well on his way back up to the car at a dead run and we were right on his heels in a mad panic, slipping and sliding up the dark hill. After a few moments, sanity returned to my sister, and she grabbed my arm and said, Wait, listen, and we stopped a few yards up the track and listened. Now you may be wondering why the sound of some rocks being thrown in the water freaked us out so much. This area was quite desolate, and the river is very cold and deep, with eddies that could easily pull you under and drown you. This riverbank is quite steep, and it's an almost sheer 25 foot or so drop to the water, with no easy footing when the tide is in and the river is up. So anybody that would be crazy enough to stand out in the middle of nowhere, in the dead of night, by a dark, dangerous river, 
and casually throw very large rocks into the water was not the kind of person we wanted to meet out there at the time. It just felt very wrong, and our instincts told us to leave now. Anyway, we stood there listening for a moment when my sister grabbed my arm again and yelling something to the effect, Oh my God, it's coming! And she ran off up the hill in a blind panic. And although I didn't see or hear anything, I decided to follow her. We made it up to the car, having slipped and fallen in the mud several times and beat on the door for her husband to unlock it and let us in. We sat in the car for a few minutes, gathering our wits, and decided to get out and have another listen. Since nothing seemed to have followed us up, we stayed close to the car this time and heard more splashing at the river. But after a few moments, we heard a single, large branch snap in the woods off to our right. It was silent for a few more moments, and we heard a soft rustling in the brush from the same area. I told my brother-in-law to throw a rock in that direction to see if we get any response, and he tossed a fairly sizable stone into the general area, and we heard a bit more commotion. I yelled, hello there, to make sure we weren't tossing rocks at a person, and got no answer. I then whistled, and heard the strangest sound I have ever heard before or since. Whatever was in the brush attempted to mimic my whistle. It didn't blow air through its lips, but tried to vocalize it. I don't know how to describe it. It was somewhat high-pitched, but had very deep undertones, and you could tell this thing had some incredible lung capacity. Oh my god, I have goosebumps. It wasn't even straining, yet had a volume several times louder than my own. This disturbed us quite a bit, and we decided to leave. We returned the next night and brought four other people with us, and within a few minutes of darkness, it would get very quiet, and then the rock throwing would dart, sometimes on our side of the river and sometimes on the other side. We returned to the area several times with several different people and always heard something. I won't detail all of the instances here, but I will note some of the stranger occurrences. After about our third visit there, we noticed a different phenomena. Just after dark, we would hear the sound of large rocks being clicked together, usually starting on the far side of the river and then answered with similar clicking from off in the woods on our side. Several times we tried to duplicate the sound, but it always sounded bigger and louder, no matter how large of rocks we could bang together. Several times we heard snapping and rustling in the brush off to both sides. We went there in the daylight to look for anything unusual, but could find nothing out of the ordinary. One interesting note, we never seen nor heard anything unusual in the daylight. Even on bright moonlit night, we often would hear nothing. My theory is this thing was nocturnal, and if there was even a remote possibility of seeing it, it would keep quiet. The only time anybody saw anything strange there was when my younger sister and I were there, were left alone at the site for a few hours, waiting for our ride to return. We were standing at the riverbank basically, just enjoying sunset, when my sister said, holy crap, it's Bigfoot, and pointed to the far bank. I looked where she was pointing, but it was too late. It had already disappeared into the brush. My sister told me she was scanning a gravel bank we had just noticed earlier that day when a large black object she had assumed was a stump or piece of log which had washed onto the gravel suddenly stood up and took three quick steps toward the woods and was gone. The sun was almost down and the gravel bank was in deep shadows so she could make out very little detail but she said it was definitely not a cow or a bear. She said it walked on two legs, and she got the impression it was walking hunched over, and that it had no neck and massive shoulders. 
that the body seemed almost impossibly bulky. She said it moved very fast, like it knew we were there, and it was trying to sneak away. Apparently, it was bent over on the gravel bar for some time. She noticed it when she first looked that way, and it was several minutes before it got up and moved. She seemed quite shaken by the event, and it was a long wait while it got dark, us there alone, with no way out and no car to hide in. I don't think we returned there after that. My sister moved back to Florida, where her husband was stationed, and I got a job there driving a truck. I moved back to Washington a couple years ago, and last summer decided to return to the area to see if there was any activity. The first time I went back, I brought along another sister, her husband, and their 14-year-old son. We arrived at the site after dark again. I had trouble finding it after such a long time. This was in the middle of July, and the moon was quite bright. And we hardly even needed our flashlight. We walked down to the riverbank, and I noticed how the place hadn't really changed at all over the years. We stood there for about half an hour listening to frogs and other night critters, and I heard nor felt anything unusual, so we decided to leave. I had pretty much figured that whatever was down there back then had moved on, but I wasn't quite ready to give up. We returned the following weekend, and this time it was cloudy and pitch black. We walked down to the river once again and stood there talking for about 10 minutes when my nephew said, shh, listen, and when we did, we heard nothing. And I was about to say that I don't hear anything when that's when I realized that was what he was talking about. It had suddenly got very quiet. All the frogs quit croaking and the atmosphere felt dead calm. It began to feel very eerie and then things happened so quickly. I have trouble recalling the exact events to this day. Two things happened almost simultaneously. We heard the yap of a single coyote very close by, which was strange. They almost always travel in packs. Then we heard something very large scrambling up the bank no more than 20 feet away. We all began to run because whatever it was, was coming right toward us and fast. I got a sudden case of the braves and said, don't run, then heard very definite heavy footsteps in the brush, no more than 10 feet away and still coming after us and said, okay, maybe jog. And we proceeded to hightail it up to the car. We sat in the blazer for a few minutes with the windows down listening and heard nothing further but none of us wanted to walk back down to the river that night. The experience had me so fired up that I brought one of the new Sony Handycams with the night shot infrared systems the next weekend and was determined to get some evidence. We went out there that Saturday, armed with a new video camera and stalked around looking for track or anything until it started to get dark. We found nothing as the ground there is not conductive to track retention being mostly gravel, weeds, or deep brush. It seemed to avoid the muddy track completely. We were at the riverbank just after dark when we heard a single loud splash and then heavy steps and brush crashing as something made its way up the bank towards us. I should note that earlier that day, we climbed down the bank to the place it always seemed to come from, and it was so rough and steep, it took us several minutes to make our way back up the bank, and that was keeping to the trail. This always came through the heavy brush. My sister and nephew ran off toward the truck, and I walked quickly backward, filming as I went, hoping to get a video of it as it emerged from the bush. It stayed just within the brush, and thus out of sight from me, and it stopped chasing me after I retreated about halfway up the hill. I was feeling brave behind the lens and started to advance back toward it and heard two more heavy steps in my direction and got the distinct impression that I should leave now. We got back in the truck and left. I haven't returned since. My sister feels it's too dangerous to go back and I won't go out there alone. 
Whatever it is, it's very territorial. I get the feeling it was charging us to get us out of the immediate area. And then when we got back to the vehicle, it was okay. The experiences I've had this time are much different than the first time. There was no rock splashing or rock clicking this time, just a sudden, and I feel very aggressive charge to get us out of there. On to the next one. The birds most commonly imitated by Bigfoot are owls. When the First Nations would go on their hunting and camping trips into the mountain, as soon as they heard an owl screech or hoot, they would stop and listen and try to distinguish if it was a forest devil imitating the owl or the cry of a wild animal, wrote Calumet River First Nation author Lucy Thompson. They would stop at once, kindle a fire. This was given as a warning to the devils that they were awake and ready to fight them if necessary. Among the Dagia-speaking Sukh, a monkey called Inda Chinga is a large, hairy trickster who hoots like an owl, sometimes appearing as an actual gigantic owl. In Europe, various traditions linked the hooting of owls to the passage of the wild hunt, a retinue of fearsome specters, sometimes fairies, sometimes the dead, traveling on a storm led either by a legendary historical figure or a wild huntsman who shares aspect of the wild man archetype. His approach is heralded by a distant bang or yelping of hounds, while a night owl, called by the Saxons Tut Ursel, flies in front of him, wrote Alexander Porteris in The Forest in Folklore and Mythology. This Ursel was said to have been a nun who died after her death, joined the huntsman, and mingled her to to who with his cry of who who travelers when he passes fall silent on their faces and lie terror stricken listening to the barking of dogs and the huntsman's weird who who these traditions found a home in the bigfoot community if you hear an owl at night where there shouldn't be one it could be a bigfoot said mike rugg proprietor of felton california's Bigfoot Discovery Museum. A better indicator that the owls are not what they seem, to quote the television program Twin Peaks, is the volume or the incredible bass frequency of the hoot, as noted by one witness in northern Wisconsin. Twice I've seen those straight line trackways in the snow near my home. Can't rule out some bounding animal double tracks, but just no evidence of that wish I would have taken pictures, but I didn't. And although there are plenty of owls around, last year I heard them calling to each other. I figured the mating thing, but the first time I started hearing it, it sounded like grown men making owl sounds. I thought, who would be joking around like that middle of the day in gun country? Crazy loud, and seemed to be on my property of 15 acres but just out of range, and I hardly have any neighbors. 800-pound owl sounds about right. It's an owl-like sound, but you clearly get the feeling that it is imitated. I thought this before I ever heard Bigfoot possibly being associated with it. There are obvious similarities between the hoots of owls and the hoots of primate. On June 1st, 2001, an Oklahoma couple searching near their lake house for a missing cat was inundated without warning by multiple owl hoots of intense volume. Slowly, some of the calls turned into jungle noises, similar to monkeys and toucans. The experience escalated into a crescendo of insane laughter from the forest. All suddenly fell silent, prefacing a loud tree break. The couple returned to their vehicle and rushed down the road, spotting a tall, heavily muscled figure whose eyes almost glowed. Interestingly, 
The most common contact calls among criminals are owl vocalization. According to Hans Gross, Gross even musically transcribed the most common imitated owl hoots, and his commentary on their use may provide insight into Bigfoot's motivations. Owls are everywhere in the woods, fields, mountains, swamps, in isolated areas, and close to human habitation. No one questions the hoot of an owl early in the evening or before dawn. Hunters even use hoot in broad daylight when summoning each other in the woods. Although animals don't fear an owl hoot, men have a superstitious dread of it. On hearing an owl, they would sooner stop their ears than watch their pockets. Based on how far apart accomplices are, a scrops owl or little owl hoot is used. The little owl is used for greater distances. As Gross notes, owls occupy a special role in worldwide folklore. In many cultures, they are regarded as messengers from the spirit world and are closely associated with a variety of paranormal entities, from the child-snatching demoness Lilith to the Strigoli Romanian vampire. In fact, the term screech owl and witch are conflated in parts of Europe. Owls are also increasingly associated with the UFO contact experience as extensively examined by author Mark Chelland. Chelland collected a fascinating story combining owls, UFO, and Bigfoot. In 2010, Chelland contacted Susan McLeod, a witness of partial Mi'kmaq ancestry who sees an inordinate number of owls around her Ontario home. In 2015, McLeod and her family were literally surrounded by owls that summer, including a bedroom window visitation on August 14th. The following morning, McLeod underwent a painful medical procedure without anesthesia, but managed the pain after slipping into a meditative state where she experienced visions of Native American imagery and a beautiful green room with a big golden retriever. When the procedure was over, the hygienist said she was amazed that Susan hadn't needed any anesthesia. Chelland wrote, it was then that Susan shared her vision about the green room and the dog. The hygienist looked shocked and said, You just described my bedroom and my dog. That evening, McLeod went into a small teepee on her property for some quiet reflection and to mourn the recent passing of a dear friend. While drumming and singing, she detected a strong, damp, musky odor and heard something moving outside, brushing against the fabric walls. McLeod left the teepee for her home, but on the way ran into two red lights and multiple eyes reflecting back at her. It was five large Bigfoot, two taller and three smaller, no more than 20 feet away. McLeod backed into her teepee, eventually summoning the courage to return home again. On the walk, she saw the Bigfoot family standing much further away. Her children met her at the door to her house, frantically rambling about shadowy shapes flying all through the house. McLeod calmed her family and, around midnight, visited her partner, who had apparently bivouacked himself in his garage workshop. He claimed to have seen similar figures, including black shadow beings, peeping in the window. Upset and unable to share her Bigfoot experience, McLeod left the garage and stood in the driveway. Chellen described what occurred. Like that morning in the dentist's chair, she again asked for help. Susan gazed up into the heavens and prayed to God. She looked up at three bright stars while praying. These points of light all slowly moved together in the sky above her, defining the corners of a giant triangle shape, initially appearing as three different colors she watched these stars meld into one beautiful, swirling orange amber yellow. She called out to her partner, and he came running out to the opening along the driveway. He looked up to see these three colored lights slowly moving apart, but the stars within the triangle were being blotted out by something giant right above them. 
They both watched as something enormous began forming itself into a semi-solid kind of matter. It was right then that she understood that all these events, the Sasquatch, the shadow beings, and now this giant craft were somehow connected. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!